Thank you so much, uh, Simon, and hello to everyone. Um, I hope you can see my screen there. Um, I will start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from unceded uh, Larrakia country, um, looking out the window uh, towards Middle Arm, one of the areas uh, which is proposed for gas expansion that I'll be talking about briefly today. And Larrakia people have, of course, looked after these lands and waters for many millennia um, and have never, ever been recognised appropriately by the machinery of legal recognition in this country. Um, and I'm privileged to live and to have worked here for the last 20 years. So um, I am really delighted to be here in an academic space again after quite some time. I finished my PhD back in 2020 and like within a month of submission, I was working at the Environment Centre NT. So I'm not used to being um, in front of uh, people like you. I'm sort of more, more used to these days standing out the front of protests and rallies and uh, talking to quite different audiences, even, you know, Senate inquiries and things like that. Um, but uh, this particular piece of research that I'll be presenting was undertaken as I was kind of transitioning from my PhD um, towards my current role. And it was completed as a collaborative piece of research with the amazing uh, Tim Neal at Deakin University. And um, I greatly miss my academic work and colleagues. Um, some of them are on this call. Simon was one of them. He was part of this wonderful group we had still going uh, called Top End STS. Um, which sort of fermented some of the ideas and enabled me to, to be able to undertake uh, the analysis and research um, that I'll provide now. So let's get on with it. Um, if I can move to the next slide, there we are. Uh, now, when you think of the Northern Territory, and I'm, I'm sort of wagering that you don't think about the Northern Territory very much. I'm making a, a bit of a guess here. We don't figure very prominently in the national consciousness as a general proposition. You might think of images like this or, you know, Kakadu, Uluru uh, National Park. This is the stunning uh, Bitter Springs, and it is absolutely a tourism icon. Um, it's part of the Mataranka Hot Springs thermal pools, visited by hundreds of thousands of people each year. And uh, it's also part of a very uh, incredible water system. And um, underneath about a quarter of the Northern Territory lies this vast karstic uh, Cambrian limestone aquifer. And it is uh, an aquifer system that keeps the Roper River and also the Daly River flowing um, and discharges into Bitter Springs and Mataranka Thermal, thermal Springs. And, and these flows, um, they're, they're quite unusual in a northern co context um, because we have a very uh, marked wet season and dry season. And this aquifer system discharging in this place keeps the Roper, Roper River flowing throughout the dry season. Um, and it sustains a lot of communities and, and, and species such as endangered freshwater sawfish, the iconic barramundi. Um, recently, a group of scientists discovered there are these crazy creatures called stygofauna dwelling in this aquifer. They uh, discovered 11 new species of stygofauna that effectively perform filtration um, functions for that water. Um, and, you know, there's this magical eruption at Rainbow and Bitter Springs, this place. Um, these flows kind of, they ebb and flow with the full moon. It's also unsurprisingly a sacred site. And um, I also think about this place when I think about the Northern Territory for all sorts of reasons, including related to my current role and the threats to this place. But increasingly, I'm thinking about a different reality here. And this is why I'm in my job and I'm not being an academic at the moment. <laughs> Um, because I'm talking to you from what we call, uh, unfortunately, the sacrifice zone. We, along with the rest of Northern Australia, are projected to become unlivable within a generation. And this reality puts everything at risk here, including Bitter Springs and the opportunity for tourists to float down at each dry season with fluorescent pool noodles. Um, and I uh, was 
appearing at a Senate inquiry a couple of weeks ago and spoke about this reality and said that I'm I'm a very privileged person and I can leave Darwin um, and my children can leave Darwin, but that's not a felt a privilege that's felt by by many living in Northern Australia, particularly traditional owners who have cared for this place for so many millennia. So the cause for this um, fairly dire forecast is fairly unequivocally um, fossil fuel extraction and burning. Um, so it may seem strange, therefore, that the Northern Territory is the site of one of the largest proposed expansions of the fossil fuel industry uh, in Australia and, and one of the larger ones in the world, I would suggest. So this map shows just um, the scale of uh, proposed gas development in the Northern Territory. You've got the Beedaloo Basin there to the south of Catherine, uh, which I'm going to talk about in some detail. To the north of Darwin, there's multiple uh, proposed uh, offshore gas fields. One of them that's been very prominent in recent years is the Bar Santos's Barossa project. Um, and, and really all roads and pipelines are proposed to lead to Darwin, to a place called Middle Arm which is also the site of vast fossil fuel expansion. Um, and it, it's this reality <laughs> uh, that we're all facing here in the Territory. Um, now, it might seem incongruous that this, this sort of uh, extraction is being pursued, um, but what I'm interested in exploring today and something that has confounded me as a former environmental lawyer is how environmental law, which is ostensibly designed to protect our environment and climate, work to do exactly the opposite? And in particular, what are the techniques used by environmental governance regimes to enact particular futures for a place in the Northern Territory that will accelerate uh, its unlivability? Um, and, you know, put another way, how does the law create felicitous conditions for governments to re-territorialise places in the image of fossil fuel extraction while maintaining responsible regulation to responsibly regulate their way further and further into catastrophe. So to explore this, I'm going to take you to the focal point of the Australian government's plans to gas fire uh, its economic recovery from the ravages of the COVID pandemic the fracking fields of the Beedaloo Basin of the Northern Territory, where competition is fierce to access uh, both globally significant unconventional shale gas reserves, four kilometres underground, as well as multi-million dollar federal grants to subsidise that access. Um, and located uh, in, in uh, the continent's hot north, for those of you who don't know the Northern Territory, uh, the NT covers um, one-sixth of Australia's landmass. It is the most sparsely uh, populated jurisdiction in Australia, with only roughly 250,000 residents, 30 of whom are Indigenous. Um, over half of the land is owned outright as freehold by First Nations people, and much of the remainder of the land is subject to native title rights and interests. Um, and the reasons for this uh, uh, are complex uh, and embedded in the colonial history of this place. But, you know, Indigenous land rights have generally in Australia had to fit within the cracks left over from settler legal dispossession. And their relative abundance in the Northern Territory illust illustrates the relative lack of purchase that settlers and their land development schemes have had here. So as mentioned earlier, climate change pro is projected to have significant impacts here as early as 2030. We're already experiencing uh, these impacts and extreme impacts by 2070. So those impacts include more severe cyclones, increased droughts, change fire regimes, more erratic rainfall and extreme temperatures. And this image was taken just last week. There are still people stranded in Darwin and around the place from a very botched evacuation <laughs> from Borroloola. Um, where, which experienced a one in 100 year flooding event following tropical cyclone uh, Megan and floodwaters still cover this place and the area uh, which I'm about to take you to, the Beedaloo Basin. Um, just upstream of this place, 40 kilometres, is Glencore's MacArthur River Mine, one of the most toxic mines in the country, uh, built literally in the middle of the old riverbed. The river was diverted to make way for that mine and um, whenever there's rainfall events like this, particularly as they uh, worsen with climate change, uh, there is a real and imminent uh, risk to people in Borroloola. 
So it's within this slowly disastrous context that the Northern Territory Government announced six years ago now that it would lift a moratorium on onshore hydraulic fracturing or fracking. And this moratorium had been imposed in 2016 when the NT's fracking industry was in a nascent state with very few wells drilled. But nonetheless, applications for exploration licences blanketed most of the Territory's landmass. That's in the previous map I showed you with particular excitement about the potential of what lay deep underneath the Beedaloo Basin, 600 kilometres into its arid interior. And this basin is now unironically dubbed by proponents as the hottest play on the planet. The moratorium was only ever uh, intended to be a pause during which the government convened a scientific inquiry. And uh, this image here is of the scientific inquiry into hyd hydraulic fracturing. It's the, the panel um, that conducted the inquiry. It was chaired by Justice Rachel Pepper. And it was a classic administrative political strategy to cool a hot situation. Um, for those of you who don't know what fracking is, I'll, I will try to, try to explain it briefly because it's rather remarkable. Um, in an engineering feat, um, what the fracking process does is it pumps water, sand and a small but very toxic mix of chemicals vertically underground through a drilled well bore up to four kilometres deep. And at the final depth, uh, the, the well directs this sort of chemical cocktail in multiple directions to enable horizontal fracturing or cracking of shale rock to release the gas trapped inside. And these techniques have been hugely controversial around the world, particularly in the United States, because of their association with impacts, including contamination of water, seismic activity, landscape transformation, pressure on transport infrastructure and human health impacts. Um, the Beedaloo Basin, if it is ever developed, um, will be the first of Australia's shale gas reserves accessed using the these techniques. It's coal seam gas um, that is being accessed via similar but uh, qualitatively different processes in places like Queensland and New South Wales. And over 6,000 wells could be drilled through the middle of that aquifer that I described earlier that discharges into Bitter Springs if this industry gets to full production. So following 18 months of furious consultation and engagement, and some people on this uh, call are coming in from the Northern Territory and they were very much engaged in this process, um, there was a foundational document released in March 2018 and in it the panel passed the environmental, social, cultural and economic risks posed by fracking and made 135 recommendations to mitigate these risks drawing on specialised fields of expertise like law, engineering, hydrogeology, geochemistry, anthropology and economics. Uh, its conclusion was that if all recommendations were applied, not only could the risks associated with an onshore shale gas industry be minimised to an acceptable level, in some instances they can be avoided altogether. And a month after the report's release, the moratorium was lifted on the basis that every recommendation would be wholly implemented. So was it inevitable that the inquiry would present fracking as safe? Our research suggests yes, thanks to what we're calling divisible governance, that is the fragmentation of risk across jurisdiction and time that is part and parcel of modern environmental governance regimes. And as you can see, some of our informants uh, agreed. Approaching fracking as an object of regulation necessarily means framing it in terms of discrete risks that can be managed and mitigated through categories established by regulatory science. And as STS scholars have demonstrated, these methods and the governance regimes that utilize them work by dividing complex environments into categories of analysis enabling the piecemeal enumeration of ecologies as entities that, that, that can then be monitored, modelled and governed. And for the last 50 years or so, this has been the keystone of most state environmental governance regimes epistemic authority. So let's go back to Bitter Springs. Um, a place like Bitter Springs uh, was split by the inquiry into categories like water, groundwater and surface water, split again into subcategories of water quantity, surface and groundwater quality, and aquatic ecosystems and biodiversity, 
and then divided finally into discrete threats like unacceptable groundwater contamination from leaky production wells. Now, of course, these individuated risks bear little resemblance to the original place or thing said to be at risk, be it aquifer wetland, ecosystem, sacred site, tourism hotspot, and the complex interconnectedness of these entities, which we are only barely beginning to understand. The categories of their regulatory capture are not disinterested or objective factors, but are rather products of social, material and textual practices that are imbued with hegemonic power relations. In this world, the value of a category like unacceptable groundwater contamination from leaky production wells is precisely that it is not place specific. <laughs> It's uh, got a meaning, but it does not relate to this place. And risk assessment um, is a product um, of the dominance of Western, typically masculine and white capitalist industrial modes of production, themselves pre premised on the elision or elimination of other situated ways of knowing and being. And fragmenting complex processes like fracking in the territory into discrete objects of regulatory risk management is a proven technique to render the controversial into the conventional and thereby render the inexistent into the inevitable. But it's not just risk that is split up or fracked. Environmental risk government governance in Western capitalist societies is further fracked in that it is fragmented jurisdictionally and temporally. In this case, jurisdiction is fragmented in different ways. The first being that jurisdiction to regulate is split between different political levels or scales. Jurisdiction is also split into different governing laws at the same scale. Within the Northern Territory's lawmaking jurisdiction, for example, there is separate legislation governing water management, petroleum operations, and environmental assessment. And in the case of the Beedaloo, jurisdiction is split in three different ways between local Northern Territory and federal uh, Commonwealth um, and international scales. So uh, here we've got former Prime Minister uh, Scott Morrison, a big proponent of the Beedaloo Basin um, and, and one of the, the, the players in the Beedaloo. And then we have splits between laws at the same scale. So within the NT's lawmaking uh, jurisdiction, of course, there are those uh, specific laws that apply. And then there can be even further fragmentation uh, between different government actors tasked with implementing these laws. So for instance, we've got some jurisdictional responsibility held uh, by the Department of Resources in the Northern Territory and some held by the Department of the Environment. But environmental governance regimes also divide time in particular ways. There is a complete bias, and this was something that I looked at in detail in my PhD, towards project authorization, when a combination of different regulatory jurisdictions interlock to apply pressure on the grant of development tenure, water licenses, environment management plans, or finance agreements. And the time apertures of project authorization can vary from a few months to a few years, and this might seem lengthy, particularly to governments and gas companies intent on making money as soon as possible or constrained by electoral political cycles. However, when you compare it to other timescales, including the shale rocks in the Beedaloo Basin themselves, um, uh, this time is minute. And those particular rocks were formed 1.5 billion years ago uh, in the pre-Cambrian age when a steaming bacteria-filled sea covered the region and complex forms of life were still a billion years away. Right now, fracking in the Northern Territory is in the midst of uh, what we've called a lengthy interregnum in capitalist time, because the project authorization process will only finish if and when final production approvals are granted. So project authorization is not a single event, but is itself splintered or fragmented. And to take a key example, that we've got a split between exploration and production approvals in the Northern Territory. Since exploration is assessed to have less significant environmental impacts and production, many of the recommendation, recommended reforms don't have to be completed until production approvals are granted. And in the meantime, the industry can advance in a piecemeal fashion by obtaining one approval at a time for discrete ex exploration activities such as drilling monitoring bores, constructing well pads, land clearing, construction of gravel pits, 
or even drilling and testing fracturing wells. So in divisible governance, categories and subcategories of risk are almost endlessly divided, shuffled in and out of jurisdictions, reordered in and out of times to ensure that extraction proceeds. And I'm going to talk now uh, briefly um, about the effect of divisible governance on a specific set of risks assessed by the inquiry, the risks associated with excessive greenhouse gas emissions generated by an onshore gas industry. And uh, the gas industry contributes in several ways to emissions. It releases carbon dioxide and methane when combusted as an energy source or in industrial processes um, via fugitive emissions during extraction and from the deliberate flaring and venting of gas from processing facilities. And globally, the energy sector co contributes around three quarters of total greenhouse gas emissions. We in Australia have one of the highest per capita rates of emissions in the world, and we're also one of the largest fossil fuel exporters in the world. Um, and often industry lobbyists will say that we only contribute a small amount of emissions, but our carbon footprint is vastly increased when we take into account our exports. <laughs> um, so how was divisible governance used to regulate greenhouse gas emissions associated with fracking in the Beetaloo Basin? With a great deal of chicanery. So the inquiry split the risk of excessive greenhouse gas emissions between upstream emissions, scope one, they're called, extraction, processing, transport and distribution of gas and downstream emissions, which is the combustion or use of that gas for industrial, commercial or domestic uses. To mitigate upstream impacts, the inquiry recommended a suite of measures be implemented prior to the grant of any further exploration approvals. And that included things like, you know, we had to have new implement new US performance standards, a code of practice needed to be developed, um, you know, those kinds of regulatory tweaks. And as these standards sort of existed elsewhere, um, their integration into our regulatory framework was treated as a simple matter of kind of copying and pasting others' words. But the recommendations to mitigate life cycle emissions, which address downstream emissions, have subsequently proven far more difficult to assess. According to the inquiry, emissions from a new onshore gas field across a range of production scenarios would contribute between 4.5 and 6.6% 6 .6 of Australia's total annual emissions. This risk was deemed unacceptable. And to mitigate the risk, the inquiry recommended that both the NT and federal governments seek to ensure there's no net increase in the life cycle of greenhouse gas emissions emitted in Australia from any onshore shale gas produced in the NT. In other words, the emissions would need to be fully offset with identified emission abatements and reductions. The inquiry didn't provide any kind of useful answers to how this could be achieved, but implicitly accepted that it would not be possible to achieve this presently or locally, suggesting anticipated future initiatives in other parts of Australia. So the recommendation thus posed a jurisdictional problem. The inquiry had been established by the Territory Government, but its implementation required the collaboration of other jurisdictions, in particular the Commonwealth which um, was widely criticised as a regressive force on climate action. You might think we've got a, a new climate-friendly uh, federal government, but um, we'll get onto that in a minute. <laughs> but more troublingly, it, it appeared that the inquiry had actually set an impossible task. Internal advice from the Commonwealth's own Department of the Environment and Energy stated that emissions from the Beetaloo may be difficult to offset and would impact the nation's plans to meet Paris Agreement commitments and could be more than four times larger than the territory, than the inquiry's estimation, more like 22% of Australia's current annual emissions. Critically though, uh, and unlike other recommendations, the inquiry gave no date or time limit for Beetaloo emissions to be fully offset. It deferred these anticipated but unrealized emissions to predicted but unrealized solutions elsewhere and elsewhere. Today, we don't know how these uh, uh, emissions are going to be up offset. Um, the election of a new federal government uh, posed some hope. But last year, we had got a very significant announcement. The chief minister said all 135 recommendations of the Pepper inquiry have been implemented and fracking can proceed to production. The problem was that they had not been. And we and others immediately called that out and said, well, hang on, you have not 
met uh, recommendation 9.8, which requires you to find a solution to fully offset life cycle domestic emissions from fracking the Beetaloo Basin. Then we had another manoeuvre suggested by the new federal government. Uh, firstly, under the safeguard mechanism, which was um, a, a change last year, uh, uh, there was a requirement that scope one, that is upstream emissions, would need to be offset completely via the safeguard mechanism. And that was welcome, but it wasn't enough. It didn't deal with scope two and three emissions. And frankly, it was something that the Northern Territory government should have been doing anyway. It should have been requiring full offsetting of scope one emissions. The question of scope two and three emissions was deferred to a new Council of State and Territory Energy Ministers, sort of managed by Federal Energy Minister and Climate Change Minister Chris Bowen. And there it still sits to this day. Um, this council meets infrequently and the issue seems to have completely stalled some six years on from the promise being made by not just the Territory Government but also the Commonwealth Government. So here we can see divisible governance at work. Uh, the risks associated with greenhouse gas emissions were dissected by the inquiry, then assessed and recommendations made. The recommendations were then split temporarily. The measures to mitigate localised upstream risks were to be implemented sooner, whereas the catastrophic climate risk associated with downstream emissions were to be dealt with at some undetermined future time through some undefined set of agreements and regulations. Uh, in parallel, the inquiry split jurisdictional responsibility for the risks and their mitigation between the Territory and the Commonwealth, implicating the federal government in the resolution of the biggest risk of all. Ulrich Beck suggests that risk assessment frameworks have difficulty dealing with large-scale ecological hazards that transcend spatial and temporal boundaries of localised action, including the threat of climate change. Despite the growing knowledge that we're exceeding planetary boundaries and that risk logic is inadequate to address this existential threat, divisible governance persists as the primary way to manage all ecological threats, including global ones. The inquiry used common risk paradigms to deal with the worldwide threat of climate change by recommending uh, that life cycle emissions simply be fully offset. However, the inquiry also divided time and jurisdiction to minimize the likelihood of this outcome demonstrating a key deception of divisible governance. It appears to be reducing environmental harms by attending to risks that are specific, local and technical, while legitimising the acceleration of those harms on a global scale. I'll conclude now uh, by uh, mentioning a new project and a new threat uh, that has loomed. And, um, preface it by reiterating what I'm sure you know, the International Energy Agency and the IPCC have said, as of 2021, we can have no new fossil fuel projects in the world if we are to meet Paris Agreement targets and avoid dangerous climate change to keep within 1.5 degrees of warming. But instead, we are seeing a doubling down. And uh, most momentously, for us here in Darwin on Larrakia country, the new climate friendly Albanese government uh, announced uh, in the lead up to the federal election that the taxpayer, that's uh, many of you in this uh, call, will fund a new gas and petrochemical hub in the middle of Darwin Harbour to the tune of $1.5 billion. And the duplicitously named Middle Arm Sustainable Development Precinct, it's just a few kilometres from where I'm sitting, and will use to fract beetaloo gas as a feedstock, as well as greenwashing other gas fields, such as Santos's Barossa gas field, itself subject to a fragmented offshore regulatory regime, um, using untested, unproven um, technologies, such as carbon capture and storage. And we will we'll dump the carbon dioxide in uh, the, the seabed of Timor-Leste um, and leave that for them to resolve at a future date. If this project goes ahead, it will change Larrakia country forever and it's currently ongoing, uh, undergoing its own fracked risk governance environmental assessment. Um, a project like this, most people here that we speak to think uh, that it can't be done safely. Um, and this slide shows the scale of some of the risks. However, it is likely that it will be found by decision makers that these risks can be reduced to an acceptable level, just like in the Beetaloo Basin. So that is what Middle Arm 
looks like now. It's part of part of Middle Arm. Um, there is also some gas infrastructure at Middle Arm from Impex and Santos, but on the whole, it's quite an extraordinary place of ecological and cultural significance. Um, and, and just to sum up, um, under the cover of intricate regulatory compliance, divisible governance sacrifices places like this. It draws every concerned actor into its gravity, their attention pulled towards its maze of forms and processes and seemingly endless technical rules. The grave impacts of resource extraction are slowly rendered acceptable, while unacceptable risks, those that might prevent a particular form of extraction, are shuffled in and out of jurisdictions and temporalities, filtered through complex or secret procedures, until their fragments become benign. Through divisible governance, the ostensibly apolitical and scientific techno maneuvers of risk assessment and mitigation reinforce each other to enact particular futures and subsume or suppress other possible imaginaries. Thank you.